by Mrs. L. Solon. Uh, the title is Refractory Out of Hospital Cardiac Arrest with Ongoing Cardiopulmonary Recitation at Hospital Arrival, Survival and Neurological Outcome after Conservative Post Resuscitation Care. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and present the main results of the study. Um, I presented uh, uh, the abstract yesterday in a rapid-fire session, and it's about refractory cardiac arrest, the survival, and the functional status at the discharge. I have nothing to declare. We know, as we've heard, that um, the survival has increased after cardiac arrest during the recent years, and that about one out of 10 survive a cardiac arrest, which is qu still quite low, in my opinion, at least. And we know that survival in patients with a refractory cardiac arrest, which is a, with a long resuscitation attempt, um, who are brought to the hospital with ongoing resusc resuscitation, has in previous studies been shown to be very low. And therefore, the use of the ECMO systems, as uh, the question was from the back, or the extracorporeal life systems, or the heart and lung machines, as you may have heard of, have been uh, examined to enhance the perfusion during the resuscitation attempt. And these studies have shown uh, variable results. And in our study group, um, or research group, we wanted to uh, look at uh, the survival and the functional status in a group of patients with refractory cardiac arrest with a long resuscitation attempt who are brought to the hospital with the ongoing resuscitation where we did not use the ECMO systems. And the, the reason for that is that we are planning a study which has included um, two patients already with the ECMO system. So this was kind of the background study for that. And the study is based on consecutive patients with a pre-hospital cardiac arrest with the, where an attempted resuscitation is attempted in an urban area in Copenhagen in Denmark. And we included a total of 4,000 patients during a nine-year study period. And as the emergency medical system is based on physicians in the, in the ambulances, uh, we have three options. Um, and either the first one is that active therapy can be terminated in the pre-hospital setting by the physician, that is uh, two-thirds of the patients, um, or the patient could be successfully resuscitated in the pre-hospital setting and brought to the hospital alive, and that was seen in one-third of the patients. And the last group that we examined in this study is patients transported to the hospital with an ongoing resuscitation attempt or refractory cardiac arrest, as I name it in this study. And that happened to 108 patients, 3% of the cohort. So it's a fairly low number, um, but I'm coming back to that. So we looked at the odds of a transport with ongoing resuscitation instead of termination of active therapy in uh, the pre-hospital setting, which is a physician decision. And we found that a younger age was associated with a transport to the hospital with an odds of 1.2, which was not very surprisingly. And if the patient suffered from the cardiac arrest in a public location, the odds uh, of being brought to the hospital was uh, 3.7, almost four times as high. And if the cardiac arrest was uh, witnessed, it was an odds of four. And if the rhythm, the primary rhythm was uh, shockable, it was an odds of almost uh, three. Uh, whereas we did not find any difference uh, with regards to gender and bystander CPR. So what was the etiology of patients with a refractory cardiac arrest? What was the cardiac arrest due to? We found that uh, nine out of 10 patients suffered from the cardiac arrest due to a cardiac cause. And further dividing that, we found that a third of the patients had acute myocardial infarction as a cause, 10% had a cardiogenic shock, and 10% with the primary arrhythmia, where you did not find any other cause, and 6% had a pulmonary embolus. And I would just like to add that in this special group with the pulmonary embolus, you might uh, treat the patient with a long resuscitation attempt if you do uh, thrombolysis. Um, and the guidelines say that you should treat the patient for more than one hour of resuscitation attempt, which is just a comment for the previous study. 
So looking at the survival, we found, um, not very surprisingly, we found a difference between the two groups. It's uh, survival after 30 days. On the left hand side, you see patients being uh, resuscitated in the pre-hospital setting and they're brought to the hospital alive. 42% of those patients are discharged and alive after 30 days. And compared to 20% in patients um, being brought to the hospital with ongoing resuscitation, um, so there was a difference there. And what we also discussed today is one thing is survival, but another thing is the functional status. Are these patients being able to carry on daily activities or are they uh, having a brain damage? And interestingly, we found that in these two groups, there was no difference in patients being discharged from the hospital uh, with regards to being able to carry out daily activities. We found that nine out of 10, both in patients being resuscitated in the pre-hospital setting and in patients being uh, brought to the hospital with uh, the refractory cardiac arrest, they were able to carry out daily activities as they were before at discharge. So in conclusion, we found that the 30-day survival after a refractory cardiac arrest was lower. It was 20% compared to 42% in patients resuscitated in the pre-hospital setting. And although we find that the prognosis is less favorable for patients with a refractory cardiac arrest, we do find that the majority were discharged with a favorable neurological outcome or a high functional status at discharge, despite a conservative post-resuscitation care without the use of uh, the ECMO or the extracorporeal life systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question? These are very uh, impressive results. Um, so it's uh, a, an especially large proportion of patients surviving, mm -hmm. uh, even in the worst uh, possible conditions. Um, so I have a question about how many, uh, what was the percentage of patients that re actually received uh, thrombolysis after this uh, unresponsive uh, cardiac arrest? And uh, the other, just one short comment that um, uh, these excellent results seem to be linked to the previous presentations that were also made by um, researchers from Denmark yeah, and probably reflect this um, uh, improvement in the overall uh, bundle care of patients with uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. And um, we were actually also quite surprised about, about the high number of 20% survival um, because other studies have found only a few percent surviving. And one of the limitations might be that we have a short response time because it's an urban area. We have a response time of only seven minutes. So it's quite low. Um, to answer the question about thrombolysis, we found that the 6% with the, the pulmonary embolus, they had the thrombolysis. And a few of the acute myocardial infarctions as well. Um, and the last question is uh, whether it's linked to the other studies, and of course it is. This and is the capital region of Denmark, it's, and we have five regions. So um, we also see that bystander CPR, for example, has gone up. In this population, 50% of the patients are being uh, treated with a bystander CPR. So it's, it's high numbers um, compared to other countries. Um, I have a question related to the presentation of, uh, from Japan. What was the time of CPR? So how long did you uh, attempt to do CPR in this mm -hmm. uh, uh, population? And uh, in line with the previous comment, it seems that Denmark is very advanced in, in, in CPR and in efforts to improve outcome of this patient with uh, pre-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, that's a very interesting question. We found that in the patients that had their active therapy terminated in the emergency department that we could not resuscitate. There was some, an average time of 65 minutes. So that's in the dead patients. And in the patients that are resuscitated, there's a widespread uh, time to ROSC or resuscitation time. But it, uh, the average is 45 minutes. So it's 10 minutes longer than in the Japanese study. And as I just mentioned, in the patients with a pulmonary embolus, the guidelines say 60 minutes if you do the thrombolysis before <coughs> you stop active therapy. 
So I agree with you on the previous comment that in some patients you might have to do a longer resuscitation attempt. And these results may suggest that we be a little bit more aggressive <coughs> than we've been before because the, the numbers are good and the neurological status is high. I would be more concerned if they were discharged with a low functional status. I, I think perhaps it's fair to say after these uh, four presentations, don't stop before 35 minutes. The age doesn't count. The reason why you are resuscitating does count. And even bring the patient to the hospital if needed, because you still can take out patients in half of these cases with a good neurological outcome, so we can return them back to society in a good shape. I think that's an important message from the four presentations. Thanks, Pascal. I, we have a question. I apologize. I might have missed this conversation. Um, in our US ACLS guidelines, we no longer do mouth to mouth for bystander CPR. It's compression, chest compressions only. So how, what's the European recommendation for bystander CPR? Do you still recommend like one breath to five compressions or how do you do that? Um, um, the current, do you want me to answer? You can take it, please. Okay, sorry. No, please <laughs> um, The current recommendations, there's a new guideline just coming in one month, so it might be changed. But the current guidelines, it says uh, 30 compressions, uh, two ventilations. But if you're in the pre-hospital setting and you don't know the person and so on, you, you can just compress. I'm just wondering whether or not that had been looked at and there were any differences in outcome. So... I think that answers mm -hmm. my question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, maybe we have some minutes to go back to the question about uh, extracorporeal life support. Or uh, is it something we can imagine, even in Denmark, to to try to use this uh, this possibility out of hospital? Do you have an experience of uh, sending people to? to put an, uh, an ECMO, for example, uh, at home? We just uh, started this study with the uh, ECMO on, in hospital. So when the patient comes in and certain conditions are uh, applied, they can have an ECMO, and, and right now we have two patients included. So we just started this. But when you have um, like hypothermia, severe hypothermia, we have uh, a team from actually from Olpo, uh, where stain is coming from, where you can uh, fly the system out to the patient. There's a specialized doctor up there. He has it all in a carry-on bag, and he can put it on on scene. And that has been used for a couple of times with patients being cooled down very severely. Yeah, maybe putting an ECMO is more efficient than cooling down. I, I don't know, but uh, it's probably more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, even so, uh, we even can imagine that uh, an ECMO system can be fitted in an ambulance, and uh, we can imagine everything. But uh, when we see the, the, the rate of survival, we, we have to, to think about something more efficient, even mm -hmm. if you already have good results. Uh, and I think especially if you have uh, areas where there's long transport distances, it could yeah. be relevant. In Copenhagen, where it's only seven minutes, you can always just go to the hospital with the patient. And I think that would be more safe with regards to cannulation and so on. Sure. So if no further question, I think we can close the session. Uh